So the singularity is this hypothesis that uh, artificial general intelligence, that is AI, uh, that is able to perform every task that humans can perform, but with a much more and greater uh, computing power, will at some point start um, a self-improving cycle that will bring to machines that are so capable, so intelligent, that humans cannot control. So personally, I don't know whether we will get to that point to this, whether this hypothesis is reasonable or not, but I know that the AI system will be much and more, more and more capable with time. And I think it's very important, and we are already doing that, that we make sure that machines are uh, aligned to our own values. Because if we do that, then in uh, both current existing AI system and also more capable one, then we are sure that they will always support um, human flourishing and well-being, as well as bringing, you know, positive impact into our life. I think that it is uh, have a similarity with the fermentation, uh, with the singularity. Mm. In, in Japanese culture, it, many things uh, using the fermentation. I think it means uh, we can freely access the internet or freely access the web service or application service. And also, we can go through the internet service with a really low cost or low marginal cost. And so it will have a large similarity with fermentation. It means that in Japan or in the, uh, we put the rice in the water and also a little bit with the yeast. We can change it towards like a sake. It's going to be the alcohol fermentations. And also, we can connect or we can use uh, computational resources everywhere in, on this earth. We can make it as a second fermentation of the digital singularities. So it means it can change, it can adapt, or it can augment everything on this planet using the digital fermentation. Well, for, I think we thrive in very much the same way that we do today. Uh, you know, we, we've already built very complex machines that are beyond human understanding just in terms of logistics chains. Um, we, we engage with the system and we work within the system, uh, um, and the system supports us in many ways. Uh, I, think, I think to really thrive, though, uh, hopefully the systems that emerge you know, if a singularity happens, helps to reduce things like inequality and improve things like energy management and logistic management. I think this planet can actually support uh, a very large number of people, uh, you know, in, in, in tens of billions um, beyond what we have today. But it's really going to take better, better supply chains, better uh, uh, and a more um, fair system distribution. I think in order to thrive, we need to remember collaboration is the key. Superintelligence must be our partner and we can't afford to misuse superintelligence. I think what we tend to forget about when we talk about AI these days, um, you know, we, we do talk about AI a lot. What about HI? What about human intelligence? It's unique. HI can design, modify, build new forms of intelligence. What else can do that? HI defines us as humans and our relationship with everything else on the earth. Um, and to advance HI, we do have to relinquish a part of our agency to, to pre-programmed activities, which we allow HI to do, sorry, AI to do at the moment. Uh, I'm working as a computer scientist and also as a media artist. So I'm not afraid of the singularity itself. I live in Japan and also the, I'm uh, grown up in Japan too. And also the, from my childhood, I'm really accustomed to the technology itself. And also the, we are now facing the many kind of the artificial intelligence and also the smartphones and also the, uh, everything is connected to the internet. Uh, however, the, I think it is kind of the uh, environment. Uh, so it means uh, it is a uh, resources for us. And also I'm not afraid of the the uh, the evolution of the computational resources because of the just AI is a kind now uh, it is to say it is now kind of the like uh, optimization process of the 
computational approach, and also that it is kind of the statical process. So uh, still now it is working for like uh, to uh, support or to augment our like uh, abilities or skills or our decisions. It's a very real possibility that many, if not most, of the jobs that we know today are not going to exist anymore. But that's always been the case when you consider technology in the longer term of human history. You know, like in the 1850s, almost three quarters of Americans were farmers, right? And now we have less than 2% of people farming. And if you were to ask a farmer in the 1850s, you know, what would be the new jobs that come about, you know, by 2020? There's no way that they're going to be able to fathom almost all or any of the jobs that we do now. You know, like that farmer is still 30 years shy of the light bulb being invented. And we're now just experiencing 30 years of the Internet. Like, think about how much that has fundamentally transformed society. So I think it's very difficult for us to bear in mind that these jobs that are disappearing are not completely disappearing. They're actually jobs that are just changing. At the moment, I think the, the biggest limitation is us as humans. How do we ensure that we co-evolve with these machines in the same powerful ways? So AI will evolve very powerfully. We know that. Um, and I think we have to accept that. How do we co-evolve? And I think that currently is the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for us, unlocking the capabilities of the human brain. Um, it, you know, what could we do if we enhanced humans in powerful ways, in the way that lots of people talk about enhancing AI in powerful ways? What would happen if every single human had a perfect memory? Imagine what we could do. Well, I hope we'll all change for the better, physically, mentally, socially. And AI can help us with that in so many ways. I mean, um, physically, we could... Um, use cyborgization to improve people's health and longevity by creating better prosthetics and by making organ donation no longer necessary, but by replacing um, people's organs, people's failing organs with intelligent um, little machines. Um, mentally, it can take a lot of uh, stress and small tasks off our brains, uh, opening up more brain space for doing things that we enjoy doing. And socially, it can uh, make it easier for people around the world to get in touch with each other, to stay in touch. And again, if we don't have to worry about the small, difficult things in life, then we'll have more time to do all that. As AI technology advances, I think a major change in our way of thinking should be the way we think about um, who we listen to and uh, who we um, bear in mind when designing these technologies, uh, who are going to be most affected by these technologies when they're being put into practice. And those are the people that we should ask for advice on how, if at all, they would want their lives to be affected, but also whose lives could be most improved by having these technologies. And those are the people that we should ask, well, um, how would they improve your life and what would improve them to an extent that uh, would make this technology helpful to you? And unfortunately, those are two modes of thinking that are being... Uh, that, that are not being used often enough these days. Um, I think we need to adopt positive narratives about the future of, of HI plus AI, so human intelligence plus artificial intelligence, because I think it's these narratives that directly affect our actions and our decision making as well, both consciously and subconsciously. The pictures we paint very much depend on the brushes we use. And, and if they're all negative brushes, um, we will adopt this sort of fear-based narrative as a starting point. And if we have that as a starting point, we will then limit our imagination, our curiosity, our exploratory instincts, everything that makes us human, everything that is core to human, we will limit. And so we have to make sure we don't do that. We have to start with a positive narrative on this. 
see, I don't know whether AI system are going to see us in any way, uh, but definitely they need to be aware of uh, what we want or what our uh, desires are so that of our goals uh, so that they can fulfill them and that's the role that they have to really out help us augment our own capabilities you know i always say that in in uh, when i was a kid i used to read the superhero you know um, uh, journals and I think that AI is going to make us all superheroes by augmenting our capabilities for benefiting ourselves, but the planet and the society and the culture, and really for making us understand better what is our human being, what it means. The next generation of AI itself is a bit of a misleading phrase because AI doesn't have generations in the same way that humans do. It's not so clear cut, you know, what was the previous generation, what's this generation, what's the next generation. It's more of a gradient, a, a gentle coastline instead of a cliff kind of a thing. Um, but how do I think that the next generation of AI will see us? I think it's going to look at us with curiosity. And I think it will want to learn from us. And that's the same way that we should look at it. I think they're already seeing us in ways that we can't perceive ourselves. It's very hard to do self-examination. Um, uh, what, what I'm essentially seeing put in biological terms right now is, is kind of an evolution that wasn't so different than biological evolution. You can think of the internet as a, as a nervous system. Uh, essentially a, a web of connections between the various cells. In this case, the cells are computers and sensors and electronic devices. And, and once you kind of have that nervous system in place, a brain starts to form to control traffic and improve, you know, essentially modeling um, uh, reaction times, et cetera. And, and that's kind of what we're seeing with AI now, building on top of this of this nervous system of, of the internet. Where does it go from there? Uh, you know, the brains kept getting bigger and bigger for a long time in biological evolution. Um, and then eventually, uh, you know, we started to um, create new brains. So what happens when a super intelligence uh, creates an entirely new form of computation that isn't limited by the computation we have today, which, which maxes out at things like the speed of light, um, et cetera. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I just know that uh, this is going to be a, a really interesting hundred years. So my advice a hundred years for now would be to really never stop learning, pushing the boundaries of what's possible but also remembering what makes us human or remembering or finding out more and more what makes us human so that science, innovation and technology can support and enhance our human values. Uh, in the last 100 years, we have improved human life in many respects, you know, in health, in life quality in length, in culture, in science discoveries, in economic growth. And now we need to make sure that in the next 100 years, will bring an even greater well-being to people, societies, and also our planet. So I don't know how the world will be 100 years from now, but I hope people will have learned how to live in greater harmony among themselves and with nature and with technology in a very cooperative environment where every human being can live out their full potential through technology also. I guess my advice would depend on whether I'm standing in a barren wasteland or a utopian dreamscape 100 years from now. Um, let's hope it's the latter. If so, um, my advice would be, well, congratulations and thank you for changing enough. And if it is the barren wasteland that I'm standing in, then my advice would be, please don't do this to us and our future. And um, there is still a chance to change the future for the better, but it will require a lot of change.